and sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed where'er I turn my eye. If I survey the ground I tread or gaze upon the sky. Please join the song that There's you're hearing. There's not a plant or flower below but makes thy glories known. And clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. While all that borrows light from thee is ever in thy care. And everywhere that man can Amen, amen. Let me hear you say amen. amen. Seemed like you didn't hear me. At the hearing of my voice, let me hear you say amen. amen. God is good. God. And all the time, God is good. At this time, I want to welcome each and every one who are here today, whether you are a member or a visitor. But it's always good to recognize the rose in our garden. So if you're visiting with us, whether it's the first time, the second time, I will just ask you to raise your hand so we can acknowledge you. Amen. The question I would like to ask you, where have you been all these days? We kept, sab we kept service every Sabbath year. Okay? So what I'm going to ask you, please to see our, second, our clerk. Or she's right at the musician right now. Please see her and she will have your membership transfer. So you don't have to miss out on Sabbath right here in Roanoke, all right? So I just want to welcome you all. And as we worship the Lord today, let everything that would distract you from getting your blessing be absent from you. So if your phone is a distraction, I ask you to silence it. And whether it's going to be a book that you love to read, I ask you to put it till later. Because truly, God has blessed us with a pastor. And he truly have a message directly from the throne of God. And he's here to deliver today, okay? So I just want to welcome you all as we worship the Lord. I just want you to take um, a chance to look in your bulletin because there is so many information for you. I don't want to read everything right now, but I want to highlight a few. This evening we will have a wonderful service. On second Sabbath, we always go to the Roanoke North Assisted Living. So I'm asking you whether you're young or old. I'm sorry, you should never call Bridging old. Whether you're whatever you are, I'm asking you to join us today, all right? Because it planned to be a wonderful time. One thing I love about those people, they always happy to see us when we come through that door. And if you think they are the happy ones, you need to check us out because we live with a happy spirit even more than all those people receive it. So I'm asking you all to join us. And if you have a little problem with your finance, there's a good ministry going on. Five o'clock tomorrow, there will be financial peace. And if you want to get on board and you don't know the leader, I'm going to ask the leader just to give a wave. That's the man around there, Elder John. Please see him and he can get you on board. Okay? So as we worship together, let us give life and come in in this month and this will be on my birthday the 26th of october there will be a blood drive so i ask you all to give life so god can be praised at this time i ask on brother mark
to give us a short announcement. Thank you. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, family. Got an announcement for you uh, this morning, and uh, it's a social committee. Many of you may remember years ago we did this event. It was a chili cook-off. It was an outdoor in the fall event, and we're bringing it back. Um, the date on it is going to be Saturday night or Sabbath closing on October 26 at 6 p.m., it will be at the home of Rob and Marie Little's house. And um, I think most everybody today has a technology to find the address, but they live out on 220 towards Fincastle. So they're not hard to find. I've already been to the house, cased it out, and it's a great place to have this event. In case of bad weather, we will come back to the church. When I say bad weather, raining, or for whatever reason, it's in the 20s or 30s that evening, we will come into the uh, fellowship uh, hall for, that, for the event. We will also have a Vespers program short to close the Sabbath with. So um, bring the Sabbath uh, equipment with you. Please bring your best pot of chili. And I recommend putting it in a uh, crock pot because that way you can cook it and keep it warm and bring it warm. Uh, we will also have um, a, a prize for the best chili, and we'll also have a prize for the best creative name for your chili. So be creative, bring, a, uh, bring your chili, and bring a great name for it. Um, we will also have a cozy fire pit. So, uh, and I brought some, uh, gonna have some vegan marshmallows, and I'm gonna bring them, so. Uh, get cozy around the fireplace. Also remember, this is important, bring a camping chair and uh, also bring um, some additional snacks and dress appropriately. If it's cold, don't forget your jacket. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, I won't be here next Sabbath, but uh, the flyer should be in the bulletin, please. If you have any questions, revert back to the flyer, and I hope to see everyone there. Thank you. Okay. You may cry. I need your help. Okay. Okay. Good morning, uh, church family. Um, I want to take a moment and thank all of you for your incredible support to the Lee McClennan Memorial Golf Tournament. So I brought a. Um, prompt, or uh, because when I did vacation Bible school, they said always have something like this. <laughs> Many have asked how they could help or donate, and I'm excited to share that the whole sponsorships have been donated by our church members instead of corporations. This allowed us to give many non-Adventist golfers participating in, event, in the event a chance to see what our church is truly about, serving our members and our community. Throughout the tournament, <laughs> This is why I've got you here. At each of the 18 holes, as a player stepped to the tee box, the golf cart would beep and display a picture of Lee. Whether it was him with his family, singing at the church, playing with the school kids, or riding on a jet ski, all these things were memorable, and all these guys that know nothing about our church saw it. It was beautiful. It was a great way to honor him. And I just want to say thank you to you guys. And if any of you guys still want to support this cause, you're more than welcome to. Um, just throw a donation in. Just say it's for the Lee McClendon Memorial Golf Tournament. And um, whenever we do a tournament from now on, we're not going to get corporate sponsors for the holes if we do this again. Um, we're going to push pictures of what our church is doing. And I just want you guys to know it's working. Thanks. Amen. Amen. You're strong, brother. You're strong. <laughs> you made it. Okay. All right. I just want to acknowledge brother and sister Timmons with us today. We want to say welcome back. We thank 
We are happy to see you and that the Lord has brought you back with us. So welcome. All right. So let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for this day as we worship you. Let us worship you in the beauty of holiness. Amen. Okay, at this time I ask you to stand as we will go straight into our music. Our first song this morning will be song number 251. He lives, he lives. Let everybody sing. I serve a risen Savior is in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever man may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, is always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. I know that he is weary, whatever man may say. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Come on, let's rejoice now. Rejoice, rejoice, O oh Christian. Lift up your voice and sing Eternal Hallelujah To Jesus Christ the King The hope of all who seek Him The help of all who find None other is so loving So good and kind He lives, He lives Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives. Let's go to our next hymn, Redeem How I Love to Proclaim It. Yay. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Redeem how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed who is in finite mercies. 
is child and forever I am redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed, redeemed, is child and forever I am redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no long which my rapture can turn. I know that the light of His presence with me thou continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed. Silent forever I am. I know there's a crown that is waiting in yonder bright mansions for me. And soon with the saints make perfect, at home with my Lord I shall be redeemed. By the blood of the Lamb, redeemed, redeemed, is silent for. Let's do the chorus one more time. Come on, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed. Thank you for your wonderful singing. God bless you. because we have two children's stories planned for you today. So come on down, and we're going to flip a coin on who's going to teach the children's story. Isn't that wonderful? Everyone wants to teach the children for children's story. Do you have a bike? Okay. Okay. I want to tell you a story about the first time that I went backpacking. Do, who knows what backpacking is? 
some of you know, backpacking is when you put all of the things that you need to go camping into a backpack, and you haul all of the stuff, all your food, your water, your tent, your clothes, everything you need to keep you warm. You haul all of that and you hike it up, usually a mountain, and you find a place, a beautiful place, a safe place to put your tent, and you camp. And I was in the fifth grade, so I was about 11 years old when I went backpacking for the first time. And I got to go backpacking with all my friends in my class. And we had a lot of kids who had never backpacked before. And we had some wonderful people in our church who loved to backpack, and they took us kids. It was so fun, because you know what they did? When kids have never backpacked before, sometimes it's really hard to hike with all of the things you need, right? It's heavy, it's a heavy backpack. They brought little goats. They brought pack goats. And these goats, they wore little vests, and we could put our things in them. We put our food on the vest or in the vest that the goats would wear, and they hiked our food up the mountain. How cool is that? Well, on this first trip, we worked hard, we climbed, we had done all of our preparation beforehand. We climbed up our mountain, and we finally found the place where we were going to camp, and we got everything all set up. We got our tent set up. Oh, it was so beautiful, the mountain. It was a really rugged mountain. The mountain was so high that no trees grew on it. We were that high up. And then you could see the mountain right there, and then right, it came right down into a mountain lake, and we were camped right on the edge of that lake. And it was kind of chilly. It was about this time of year. And we were so hot and sweaty, and we had been working so hard that after we got our tent all set up, we went swimming in that cold mountain lake. And let me tell you, it was cold, so cold. I don't know if you would have wanted to swim in it, but we, some of us at least, were very hot and we wanted to get in, so we got in. And we had played in the water for a little bit and then it was time for dinner. And we started to make dinner, but something started to happen. When it was dinner time, our leaders, they were getting all of the things they needed to make our dinner and it started to rain. Is it easy to make dinner in the rain? No, it's not. So they told all of us kids to go into our tents so that we could stay dry. Our leaders stayed out in the rain and made us dinner, and they brought us dinner while we were all sitting in our tents. And that's how we spent the rest of the night, was in our tents, enjoying each other's company, playing games, and eating dinner. And then it started to get cold, and so we all decided, well, maybe we should go to bed. So we all got our jammies on and our warm socks on and our hats on and we went to bed that night. Well, the next morning when we woke up and we looked outside of our tent, there was three inches of snow on the ground. It had gotten so cold that the rain had turned to snow and now there was snow on the ground. I was so grateful that my mommy had gotten me some nice warm socks and some a base layer, uh, like your clothes that you wear underneath your normal clothes to help keep you extra warm. And I, I was so warm and I was so grateful. And we decided, well, the snow's not that fun, so we should probably just pack up and try and get back down the hill before... Um, we get any colder. So we quickly got up, ate breakfast, started to pack our things, and I had gotten all my things back in my backpack. The only thing that was left was to put the tent away. And so we were just hanging around, trying to help other people get ready to go. We wanted to pack the tent the last because it was wet from the rain and the snow the night before, and we didn't want it to get all of our other things wet. So we were helping everyone get packed up, and one of the leaders came over to me and my friend Joni, and she said, now, are you guys warm? Are you okay? And my friend and I said, yeah, we're, we're toasty warm. We're good. We're having a good time. And our leader said, well, one of, our, one, of our, um, one of the kids that is with us did not have very warm socks. And they got very cold last night. And their feet are very, very cold. And we want you to go into this tent here that's still set up, 
and we want you to zip it up, and we want you to put her cold feet on your warm tummies. Have you had someone touch you with their cold feet before? Uh, Is it a good thing? (laughs) Does it feel nice? No. And I did not want to do it. Let me just tell you. I did not want to have her put her cold feet on my tummy. And I told my leader, I was like, I don't really want to. She said, well, we want to do this now because if we don't, she could get frostbite on her toes. She's been cold for a long time, and we need to quickly warm them up so that we can get her down the mountain so she can get some warm, warm, dry clothes on. And this girl that we were helping, she didn't have very many friends. No one liked this girl. And sometimes she was a little mean, and that might be why she didn't have very many friends. She, she wasn't someone that I spent a lot of time with. But I decided, okay, I think I can help this girl. And so my friend and I, we went into the tent. We zipped it up. I undid my coat. She took off her wet socks. And then she put her foot right here on my tummy. And we just sat there. And oh, oh, my friend and I, we were squealing. We were making all kinds of noise, trying to bear the cold feet on our warm tummies. But in a few minutes, though, it started to get warmer. Her feet got warmer, and it started to get better and better. And after a while, her feet were warm, and she was able to take them off of our bellies and put on nice, dry socks. And we were able to get her ready to go, and we were able to get down the mountain safely. And she didn't have any more problems with her feet after that. And I want to tell you something. When Jesus was alive on this earth... He told his disciples what it was going to be like when he came again at the end of this earth. And and in the Bible, it says that Jesus, he's going to come in the clouds with all of his angels. And he is going to gather unto him all of the people that love Jesus. And he's going to say, come I am so grateful for you. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I had no clothes, you gave me something to wear. When I was sick, you helped me feel better. He said all of these things to the people that love Jesus. And they're like, we didn't see you, Jesus. We didn't give you food. We didn't give you water. And Jesus says, when you do these things, to your brothers and sisters here on this earth. It's the same as if you were doing it to me. Because you know what? Jesus loves everybody on this earth. He loves all the people who are mean to us. He loves all the people who maybe aren't our friends. He loves all the people who have cold feet. And when we do nice things to other people, it's as if we are loving Jesus himself, okay? So I want to remind you guys to help take care of each other, help take care of people that come into your life, because when you do, we're loving Jesus, all right? Okay, let's say a quick prayer, and then you guys can help go gather some money, okay, for the children's offering. Let's close our eyes and fold our hands. Dear Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you so much for the Sabbath day, for a day of rest, and thank you for your Bible where we can read stories about you and about stories who, of people who loved you. And Father, we just pray that as we learn more and more about you in our Bibles, that you would change our hearts, change our minds, and give us the love that you have for our neighbors so that we can treat them the way that you would treat them if, they, if you were here right now. We love you so much. Amen. The Lamb's offering today is for the partnering for recruitment materials for the Roanoke Adventist Christian Church. Thank you so much.
Good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, before we call the o officers, the deacons, um, to come and do the collection of the tithe and offerings, I would like to make an emphasis of the loose offerings today, which will go for the Washington Adventist University. Now, uh, one of the ways that will fulfill the commandment of Jesus to be able to preach the gospel, one of the key is through education, the various universities that we have in the world, and also through the health ministry. But today the FNC is going to the Washington Adventist University uh, because they are celebrating their 120 years of existence. And 100% of these offerings are going to help uh, give scholarship to those students who do not, who come short of such financial needs. And as you give your contribution, my prayer is that while you give it, uh, think that you are contributing to the expansion of the gospel. One thing I like about the Adventist church, it's a global movement. It's a worldwide global movement. And uh, it's one of the key and the fundamentals that we have in the Adventist church is the education system. And, uh, I just pray that as you extend your hand, I'm sure you'll be blessed when you think about this donation you are going to do, especially the emphasis that is coming today, that this offering will go to the University, Washington Adventist University. I will ask our deacons to come so that I can offer a prayer as they will do the collection. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you because you are offering us an opportunity to be able to worship you through our tithes and offerings. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, and uh, our prayer is that may you continue to bless us so that we may be able to be your hands and be able to help those who are in need. But most importantly is to be able to fulfill the grand commission you have given us, to go out to the world to be able to preach the gospel. And one of the means that this world movement has cho chosen is through the means of having facilities such as uh, these universities, not only in the US but around the world. As we give my prayer, Heavenly Father, May you be the constant one that whatever we give, when we multiply it, it may be able to bless someone. This is my humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
morning, church. Our scripture this morning is Our scripture this morning is from 2 Peter verse 2 chapter 2 and verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. That time in the it's that time in the service uh, where we get to share in uh, family prayer together during our garden of prayer. David in Psalm 102 says, "Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let me cry, my cry come to you. Don't hide your face from me, and in the day of my trouble, incline your ear to me. In the day that I call, answer me speedily." May that be our prayer and may you know as we pray together that God hears and that he answers prayer. If there are those in the congregation this morning as we sing our prayer song that would like to come forward because you have a particular need, you're praying for somebody, there's there's an issue, you need a, a special prayer for yourself, you're welcome to come forward as we sing our song here uh, this morning. Just a reminder, Kofi, yeah. <laughs> Hear our prayer, O Lord. You got it. Incline thy ear to us and grant us thy peace. We're grateful, Father, that we can come before you and know that you, your ear is bent toward the prayers, the cries, the petitions of your children. We are grateful that we can come before you as a church family and know that you are our God and that we are your children. You've brought us through another week and for that we're grateful. Uh, whether it was a good week, whether it was a challenging week, Whether it was high or low, uh, whether it was good or bad, we know that, Lord, you are always good and your mercies endure forever. And so we've come to give you praise and thanks and uh, recognize your goodness in our lives. You are the great creator, the one who made all things, the one who is holy and that is just and that is good. And you are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our lives, our lips, our hands, our feet. And so we bring them to you this morning as offerings to our great God. Please accept them from hearts true and sincere, hearts that recognize that you are good and that uh, hearts that uh, from hearts that know that you are God. Lord, we recognize our great need of you. We're thankful that you sent Jesus into this world who lived, who suffered, who died, who rose again, and now who mediates for us in heaven's sanctuary and has promised to come back for his children. We long for that day when the heartache and the grief and the distress that is around us and in this world and perhaps near to us will one day all be gone. When uh, tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes will be a thing of the past, where death and pain and suffering will all be said and done. We're looking forward to that day. We long for it. And in the meantime, we know, Lord, you have us here for a reason and a purpose. Our lives are not our own. Uh, They've been bought with a price, even the precious blood of Jesus. And so we give you our lives and ask them to make them as you want them to be and that you will take us and use us to be a blessing to those around us. Help us, Lord, to be available and to be used by you. And we thank you for the high and holy privilege 
to be able to be called your children and to be called fellow laborers together with our God. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. Those that have come forward, they know they're recognizing special needs this morning. And we're, knowing, we're praying, Lord, that you will take those cares up, those concerns up and do something special in each life. This is the confidence that we have in you, that if we ask anything according to your will, you hear us. And if we know that you hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of you. Thank you, Lord, for hearing, for answering, not because we've prayed it, not because there's anything in ourselves that could merit value or worth in your sight, but because we come in the name of Jesus and we pray all these things through his name and for his sake. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I think it was on Thursday of this week that uh, Gregory Gooden left his home and then uh, when a little later in the day a new and different man arrived in the Gooden household. Was it Thursday or was it Wednesday, Jaden? It was Thursday, yeah. Um, in fact, Gregory left as a Jamaican and he came back as a US citizen. And so we want to congratulate you this morning here, Gregory. There is a new U.S. citizen in our congregation. There is a new U.S. citizen in the Gooden household. Congratulations. What a blessing. And uh, this is certainly a great country. There's no question about it. Um, there, there are many of us sitting here standing today that are from a different part of the world, but there is really no country that has uh, the freedoms and the, uh, the constitution that uh, this country has. And so it's a great country uh, and it is for now uh, a good country. And we pray that freedoms will persist until the gospel can go to all the world. This morning I want to continue our, our study together uh, looking at the temptations of Jesus and this series uh, has been entitled Earth Wars and we're in our third part. Next week will be our last message uh, in this little series that we've uh, spent together. Last time uh, we looked at the Orion Nebula, one of the many stellar uh, nurseries in the universe. This is where they say stars are born. It's a stunning nebula. This is just one image that you see behind me. And uh, the nebula makes up a part of what is known as Orion's sword in the constellation Orion. In fact, Orion is probably one of, and there, there are 88 different constellations uh, within our Milky Way uh, galaxy, I understand. But it's one of the easiest constellations to see in the nighttime sky, not necessarily now, but between November and January. And it comprises a number of very bright stars, including uh, uh, Regal and uh, Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, and, uh, and the three stars that make up Orion's belt. I'm not going to even attempt to name those. There are these, each of these stars are various distances from the Earth. The closest star in the Orion constellation is Bellatrix, a mere 245 light years away. Now, of course, you know that light years aren't measured, is not measured in distance, or at least uh, in time, but in distance. And that's about 6 trillion miles. 6 trillion miles times 245, just a mere 245 light years away. Then there is uh, the 
Then there is uh, Betelgeuse, which is five to six hundred light years away. And there is, oh, there they are. That's Bellatrix, that's Betelgeuse. And then there is Saif. Saif is 650 light years away. And then you have Rigel, which is 864 light years away. Now, both Betelgeuse and Rigel are two of the ten brightest stars in the night sky. Betelgeuse is about 700 times the size of our sun and has about 7,500 to 14,000 times brighter. Now, Rigel has a mass of 21 times our sun and Rigel shines 47,000 times brighter. These are massive suns in the galaxy. Interestingly, scientists have discovered exoplanets, or these are planets outside of our solar system that are orbiting other stars or suns in Orion. And it makes you wonder whether there is life on some of those planets. It's a fascinating thought, considering the Bible evidence speaks to created intelligences on or in the universe. Orion is made up of three times, uh, mentioned rather, three times in the scriptures. And in, when it's mentioned, it's always mentioned in reference to the grandeur and the goodness of God. In Job chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, we have these words on the screen. He, God, made the bear, Orion, and the Pleiades, these are constellations, and the chambers of the south. He does what, what friends, if you can read that, great things. He has done great things past finding out. Yes, wonders without number. In association with the constellation Orion, the profundity, the magnificence of God, His power, His might, His knowledge, His wisdom are mentioned. But I want to tell you this morning that one of the greatest wonders in this universe is that God would send His Son in the far reaches of this universe to this one rebel planet to save it. When you see Orion in the evening sky in the next month or two, remember God has done great things. Remember that his wonders are without number when it comes to your and my salvation. That's what Orion's up there for, to remind us these constellations that God is good and worthy to be praised. And what did, what did Jesus do? We looked at Romans chapter 8 last week and verses 1 through 4, and I'll just read a part of it to you here this morning to remind us what Jesus did. The Bible says that, that what God's law, the foundation of his throne, the center of a, Satan's attack on God's character, what the, God's law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh because we were too weak to keep it, and therefore without hope, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, condemned sin in the flesh. And how did Jesus condemn sin in the flesh? By keeping God's law perfectly. By showing that God was not unjust in his claims of obedience toward humanity. And as a result, Christ would give us his righteousness, something that we don't possess, something that we cannot manufacture or come up with ourselves. And he would also provide overcoming power to the temptations to di toward disobedience, which we absolutely needed. These are the wonderful things that God has done for us. That God's law, what it couldn't do, and that we were weak through the flesh, God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in you and in me. God is good. Can someone say amen? amen. So in doing this, of course, Christ would do battle with Satan on his own turf. This is just a little review for those who may have missed previous messages. And he would do battle on Satan's turf, and he would seek to turn the tide to affect a counterforce to Satan's influence here on planet Earth. And that struggle would begin in the wilderness of temptation. The first temptation, you remember, the one where Jesus was tempted to turn stones into bread, we learned that this temptation was in the area of appetite and passion. 
That was the area in which this, uh, this temptation came. Appetites and passions covers all of the uh, temptations to follow our gut instincts or to do what we desire or to do what we feel like we want to do or just to reason the things that we want to do or just to do what we want to do. And Proverbs 14 verse 12 sums this up, this mentality, this mindset, uh, this a school of education best where it says there is a way that seems right unto a man but the end is the way of someone knows the verse the end is the way of death the most common results of yielding to appetite and passion is a loss of self-control that's really what it's about and it comes in several areas you may uh, lose self-control in the area of food or drink or substances And that would lead to gluttony or or substance abuse or addiction or disease. You could have loss of self-control with temper, which leads to impatience and anger and potentially even violence. You could have a loss of self-control in the area of sexuality, leading to the viewing of pornography or fornication or adultery or self-abuse or perversion, adultery uh, uh, or uh, disease and early death. We saw that when Christ faced this temptation on the food, he was weaker than any other human being has ever been and will ever be. And Jesus Christ was victorious by relying on the Holy Scriptures and relying on the Holy Spirit. He was victorious as a human being and Jesus worked no miracle to get out of that temptation. He did it for you and for me. And friends, you and I can only be victorious over appetites and passions the same way. The same way Jesus was through the scriptures and through the Holy Spirit. Plus, if I may add, we have Jesus as our great high priest. And so if we fall, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Jesus had no high priest. He must overcome or the plan of salvation would have faltered. It would have fallen. And so Jesus did this for you and for me. Jesus earned the right to become our redeemer by overcoming as a real human being so that he could take our place and pay the wages of sin, which is death, take upon himself our sins. And the Bible says that victory is available in Jesus Christ to all who surrender to him. The Bible verse that speaks to this, this school of thought is Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. But the devil wasn't done with Jesus and I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 4 and we'll look at the second temptation together. Matthew chapter 4 and we'll look at verses 5 through 7. Matthew chapter 4 verses 5 through 7. It says, Then devil took him up into the holy city And set Jesus, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. Now the devil has a different tactic, a different strategy here. And he says, he shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. So you've heard of stories, Uh, you may have read them, you may have uh, read them in the paper or or the news, someone is climbing to a mountaintop or a favorite peak or a cliff and they get close to the edge and for them they get too close. It didn't have to be a sad ending but they slipped or they didn't realize they were right at the edge or they just had to get that perfect selfie and everything would be okay. They thought sometimes people can get overconfident which leads us to making some pretty presumptuous and and silly, foolish decisions. If you've seen a picture of someone sitting like this one on on an edge, overhang or a cliff, you may have thought to yourself, man, that's a little bit risky. I'm not sure I would do that myself. But sometimes it's kind of hard to tell whether it's presumptuous or not. Because we can't know and we don't know the person's skill set and skill level. So whether they have skills or whether they don't. So it's hard to know really whether it's presumptuous or not. But when we think about this temptation of Satan taking Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple and telling him to cast himself down because the angels of God would take care of himself, uh, 
Would you find that to be a temptation for yourself? Now, someone here today might be a little uh, uh, adventurous, perhaps. I'm not sure, but that doesn't come to mind for me. If the devil took me up there, I'd say no. I'm not interested in throwing myself down. I don't think it's a good idea. And I think many of us would probably agree it wouldn't be a temptation to us, which then begs the question, like the first temptation, this temptation of Jesus, that has a profound effect on our lives, yet it can be very hard to understand how this temptation really affects you and, you, and me. How does it affect you and me? Jesus' faith was strong, very, very strong that he probably wouldn't have been afraid to jump. That's probably very likely. He knew what angels could do. He knew his father. He knew his father cared for him. It wouldn't be a problem. He didn't have any fear. He knew his father would help him. But I want you to understand this isn't really unusual. You know, some children will put so much trust in their daddy to catch them that they'll fall or they'll jump off something that's kind of high, maybe not too safe, uh, to, and cry out to their daddy, catch me, daddy. And daddy will, in the most part, catch them. Many of us have had younger children, and we know what it's like. Some of us have young children today. And uh, dad may put his child, when mum's not watching, on a dresser, uh, somewhere on the bed, maybe up a little higher, uh, relatively high, and then tell their child, hey, just jump. I got you. Dad will catch you. And the child has a blast and now they're back up there and they're, now they're taking the initiative. Catch me, daddy. And they do that several times and they just keep rolling along like that. And now dad isn't so sure that he should keep doing this because the child's becoming a little bit overconfident, maybe a little bit too much. And before you know it and you're reaching out to take it, I think, son, I think we've had enough, ready to take him down, he just jumps and before you know it, you've got to throw your arms out and catch him. And you catch him or you nearly catch him. And we've seen that before. So you know that a child can have faith in their daddy, you see. And Jesus had complete trust in his father, 100%. No question about it. So this temptation of Satan could be a real temptation to Jesus to show that he was really the Son of God. Do this to prove you are the Son of God. I want you to remember last week we covered how Jesus went without food for how many days? 40 days. He was emaciated. He was struggling to even think. And in that state of mind, a human being naturally is very suggestive. And if Jesus jumped, he would have shown, would he have shown faith in God? Would that have shown faith in God or would that have been presumption if he had jumped. God recently spoke from heaven at Jesus' baptism. Behold, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So wouldn't trying to prove that he was the son of God by jumping be putting God's word to the test? And if Jesus jumped, he certainly wouldn't really be showing faith, but instead he'd be showing doubt and he'd be showing uncertainty. So what's the difference then between faith and presumption? What's the difference between faith and presumption? Faith and presumption can appear to be very, very similar because they both claim the promises of God. They both claim the promises of God. If you've ever sat in a church board meeting, like some have here, you'll know that these words get tossed around a little bit, especially when there's money to be spent on a particular ministry or a particular thing. And perhaps if the money is spent, it will drain the fund or we'll get close to draining the fund. And some suggest, well, we should just step out in faith. There's a work to do. God will provide. He always comes through. And then there are others who say, well, that's a, there's a fine line between faith and presumption. And I think we're about to step over that line into presumption. Who's right? Who's right? And you may have had a similar discussion in your own home when it came to or comes to making a very important purchase, you see. Faith and presumption can seem very similar because they both claim the promises of God. However, there are very important differences. You see, presumption is the counterfeit of faith. Presumption is the counterfeit of faith. And the only person and only the person who has true faith 
is secure against presumption. And so what's the difference? I'm going to read to you a short passage from Desire of Ages. And I think it was, is it already up there? Oh, okay, let's see. We go back. Oh, there it is. Presumption is Satan's counterfeit of faith. Faith, here's what faith is. Faith claims God's promises and then brings forth fruit and obedience. So faith brings obedience. Faith leads toward obedience. And then it goes on to say that presumption also claims the promises of God, but uses them as Satan did to do what, friends? Excuse transgression. This is from my favorite book, Desire of Ages, page 126. So you see the difference. So where is the presumption in Satan's temptation to Jesus here? So let's go back to Matthew chapter 4 and let's read verse 6. You remember, he takes him up to the, high, the temple, the pinnacle, cast yourself down. And then notice what he does, a different strategy. He quotes the Bible and he says, doesn't the Bible say, he shall give his angels charge over you and... In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. What Satan is doing here is quoting the Old Testament scripture in Psalm 91. And I actually want to invite you to go over there with me. Psalm 91. He's quoting Psalm 91. But did he quote Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12 accurately? Did he quote Psalm 91, 11 and 12 accurately? And you will see that there is something missing from the verse. Notice Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. So what changed? The devil quotes Psalm 91 verses 10, 11 and 12, but he leaves something out. Did you catch what he left out? To keep you in all your ways. He kept it out intentionally. So you know the devil quotes scripture. Just because someone comes along and shares Bible text with you doesn't mean they're from God. The devil can quote scripture, but he'll, misconst- he'll construe it. He'll twist it to our own destruction. And so he comes, he leaves out that line to keep you in all your ways. So what does it mean to be kept in all our ways? What does that mean? It just simply means when you're obeying God. God will protect you when you're obeying him. That's what it really means, to keep you in all your ways. Angels are sent to watch over us, to bear us up, primarily to help us be loyal and to be obedient to God, to keep you in all your ways. And so the big question is, did inviting Jesus to jump off the pinnacle of the temple serve that purpose? And what's the answer? Absolutely not. It served none of that purpose at all whatsoever. So we saw that Adam and Eve, or Eve in particular, she was over- overcome by the temptation of appetite and passion. Did Adam and Eve, were they succumb, did they, were they overcome by the sin of presumption? Think about it with me for just a little bit. Did they, were they overcome by the sin of presumption? Do you think that they presumed upon the love of God to save them from the consequences of their sins? God had said to them, if they ate from the forbidden tree, what would happen? They would die. That's right. What made them think they could retain the blessings of the garden, the blessings of life, if they transgressed God's law? What made them think that? What made them think they could do do that and get away with it? Presumption. So that's one way in which presumption is shown. One way presumption has been shown many times in history is how individuals act bold and irreverent in the presence of Almighty God. Sometimes people approach God or talk to God as if he's their buddy, next on their level with him, so to speak. No reverential fear for God at all. You think of, for example, the story of Moses and the burning bush. And there's quite a contrast with what happens here with the way many people, Christians included, approach God. You remember God told Moses uh, in Exodus 3 verse 5, Draw not nigh or hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is, what friends? Holy ground. Now this isn't a verse to encourage us to take our shoes off but while we're walking into the sanctuary. But how often do we think about that when we come into God's house? This is a holy place, yes? Why? Because the preacher's here? No. Because you're here? 
No, because God is here. This is his house, you see. We have a tendency to be rather casual when it comes to God. Of course, he's not showing up as a burning bush, but I do wonder whether if he did, it would get our attention. Maybe we would be more serious. Then there's a story in the Old Testament scriptures about Nadab and Abihu. Uh, They had a serious problem with the sin of presumption. Notice what it says in the book of Leviticus, chapter 10. It says, Nadab and Abihu, these were the oldest sons of Aaron. They took either of them his censer and he put fire in it and put incense thereon and offered strange fire. This was not the fire they were supposed to use. Before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And what was the result of doing that? And they went out, from, uh, went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. So they went out before the Lord, and going before the Lord means that they went into the sanctuary. They were right there. And they had just been trained, and they had just been instructed in how to do their jobs as priests. Adab, uh, Nadab and Abihu, the two oldest of Aaron, they had the greatest privileges among the children of Israel. So how could they have rationalized what they did that day? How is that possible? What did they do? Well, it didn't help that they were drunk. They had imbibed intoxicating beverages. And we know that because by the end of the story, there's a warning to Aaron and the priests to never imbibe drink, especially if they're going into service and into the house of God. And so Nadab and Abihu were being presumptuous. Another famous act of incredible presumption in the Old Testament was that of Hophni and Phinehas. Hophni and Phinehas were the sons of Eli, the priest. Hophni and Phinehas and the elders uh, removed the ark of Almighty God from the sanctuary, something that they shouldn't have done, but they took it because they knew this was the presence of God and they took it to battle against the Philistines in the hope that this would shore things up and that God would deliver them. The story is found in 1 Samuel chapter 4. But it tells us in this story that God didn't help them. And there was a lot of death and Israel was defeated. And notice what it says. It says, so the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated and every man fled to his tent. There was a very great slaughter and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Also the ark of God was captured and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, they both died. So the the surprising thing in this story really has to do with the Philistines and how they treated the ark. They tended to have more respect than Israel did. They had respect for it. They didn't uncover it and look inside of it, which is kind of surprising. However, since having the ark, you probably remember the story, what came to the Philistines? There were plagues that came. And so they figured that the God of the Hebrews wanted his chest back. He wanted the Ark of the Covenant back. And so they took it back to Israel. And the Philistines, they put it on a a, a cart drawn by animals. And you were never supposed to do that. The instructions to Israel was that it was not to go on a cart. But the Philistines did not know. And therefore, God did not hold them accountable. But when the ark arrived with the cows pulling it to Beth Shemesh in Israel, uh, the inhabitants there in Beth Shemesh, they got a little curious. And they uncovered the ark, they opened it and they looked into it and they had the instructions of the ark that it was never to be, it was to be regarded with awe and it was to be regarded with reverence. Levites couldn't even look upon the ark when they moved it. And only once a year, the high priest went into the most holy place and there he could look once a year upon the ark, the sign of God's splendor and glory. The presumption of the people of Beth Shemesh resulted in a large number of dead people slain by the glory of God. Because you've got to remember, sin and the glory of God don't dwell together. They just don't mix like uh, clay and and iron. They didn't understand the Ark of the Covenant represented something unique, the presence of the glory of God. Now, there's no Ark on earth today, but doesn't the world, including the Christian world, treat the Ten Commandments with a degree of presumption as well? The Bible says that God's law is holy, and it is just, and it is good. Well, one of the probably the, West, the best known story, Old Testament story or figure, who had the great sin of presumption was King Saul. 
Saul was told at one time to wait for the prophet uh, and the priest Samuel for seven days to come to offer sacrifices. But Saul and his men got a little antsy. And Saul's men got a little fearful and they began to abandon the army. And so Saul reasoned to himself to keep the gentleman there. The prophet hasn't come. I'll offer the sacrifice myself because we can't afford to wait for Samuel. And so he did. Now you have to understand that only priests were ordered by God to offer sacrifices. So Saul was being incredibly presumptuous. He sought God's blessings while disobeying him. And when Samuel came, Saul went out to meet him as if he had done some great thing, some wise thing. He just assumed Samuel would say, good, I'm glad you did it. I got detained. Someone had to do it. It's not how it worked. But Israel's king presumed upon God while actually disobeying God and the results were disastrous. We read this and Samuel said to Saul, you have done what friends? Foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of God, the, the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man or a, another man. Now that wasn't the end for Saul. Because God is a God of second chances. Someone can say amen to that. He's a God of second chances. And so uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul was given another chance to see if he would obey God. Remember, he was supposed to destroy all of the Amalekites. They were prodigiously wicked people. We can't understand how wicked they were. And it was a judgment from God. And so he told them, you need to destroy everything, the animals. But what did Saul do? Saul brought back the king of the, of the Amalekites, Agag, as a trophy of war. He was really doing what other kings had done back there, a trophy. And he also brought back herds of flock and flocks of animals. And Samuel asked him, why did you bring back all these animals? And Saul said, like he was doing something great, for sacrifices to the Lord, of course. Like his idea was better than God's. So you see again, faith claims the promises of God and well, faith claims the promises of God and obeys. Presumption claims the promises, but excuses a transgression. And that's what Saul was doing here. So Samuel asked why he disobeyed the voice of the Lord. And in 1 Samuel 15, verse 20, Saul claimed, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. That's what when Saul said, these animals are a sacrifice to God. He thought he'd done something honorable. He thought he'd helped God out. And that's when Samuel pronounced those famous words, to obey is better than what, friends? To sacrifice. That's right. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also, uh, he also has rejected you from being uh, king. Now, we've covered several Old Testament stories of presumption, but what story in the New Testament speaks to the sin of presumption like no other. Can it, does, does it come to mind? There, it was a, there was a couple in the church, Ananias and Sapphira. That's right. They promised to give all of their gain from the sale that they'd made of their property to the church to better and to help the people in the church. They made this particular promise. Well, apparently they got paid more than they were expected to get paid. And so they decided to change their minds on the amount and keep a portion of the profit to themselves. Ananias went to the apostles uh, with his contribution, pretending as though it was everything that he had promised. And Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the, pl the place uh, piece of the price of the land for yourself. Then Ananias, uh, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. Well, his wife Sapphira was waiting and she waited a while and couldn't figure out where he was. So she went to go look for him. She eventually arrived where the apostles were. Peter asked her, how much money uh, did they receive from the sale? And she told the same lie as her husband. Peter questioned her presumption and testing the spirit of the Lord and told her that she would soon be joining her husband. The Bible says, and immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in, found her dead, carrying her out, buried her by her husband. Pretty serious stuff, isn't it? Now, Ananias and Sapphira seemed to believe that they could lie and that God wouldn't know. Can we be that way as well? 
Can we do things and kind of just dismiss uh, the reality that angels and the God of heaven know what we're saying and what we're doing? Sure. We can and perhaps we have. That's presumption. What other ways could we be committing the sin of presumption today? Let's bring it home a little bit. A friend of mine who taught Bible class at one of our academies was uh, teaching on these three temptations to his class. And he wanted them to see how the second temptation, the one that we're talking about here today of Jesus, could be re- uh, real in their own lives. How it could really meet, meet, uh, meet uh, how they could meet those particular temptations. So he had a brainstorming session with them and they came up with some ideas. One of the students said, well, if you're expecting friendship or popularity when you talk down or insult people, that's kind of presumption, isn't it? What do you think? Uh, that'd be pretty presumptuous. You expect to be friendly with people, but then you treat them like dirt. Mm, bit of presumption. And so uh, uh, what else? Uh, one of the other students said, pray for a good grade on a test when you haven't been attentive in class and didn't study for the test. <laughs> oh, God, help me. Help me get a good grade. Hmm, interesting. Interesting. They realized that they'd been, had approached some of their own tests kind of presumptuously. Now, um, in the principle, that could apply, of course, to many things for us. Can you expect good results in anything in life when you've been lazy or haven't done your part? No, your marriage, if you're lazy in your marriage and haven't done your part, then uh, your marriage is going to be a shambles. Uh, in your workplace, if you're pl- praying God to bless your work and you're lazy and you don't do your job well, then there's going to be results and consequences, right? Yeah. So these things, this principle can apply to, to many, many different things. And one student asked, well, if somebody smokes, but they expect to be a, a, a track star, is that presumptuous? Sounds pretty presumptuous to me. But that led to a larger question with regard to health, because people pray for God to heal them when they're refusing to follow certain basic health principles. That's kind of presumptuous, right? Much of the time, people end up in a health crisis because of not following instructions that God has given us on health. Much of that instruction is in the Old Testament scriptures, and people often, Christians, throw that out. But when they're sick, they want a miracle from God. And uh, though they don't want to follow what he said, that kind of seems a little presumptuous, doesn't it? Now, sometimes people blame God for poor health. God, why did you do this to me? Because they have a really concerning illness or a concerning disease. That's kind of presumptuous when their choice is to uh, blame God. Now, I want to keep a balance here. I'm not saying that all sickness is because someone has uh, broken the health laws. I'm not saying that. And neither am I implying that some people deserve healing and others don't. In fact, God works with people because he wants us to learn. He wants us to grow. He's compassionate and merciful. And I believe that he often heals people who have been presumptuous because he is trying to give them a second chance. That's the God we serve, the God of second chances. Now, that, my, that Bible class my friend was teaching, they had a, a more modern example of presumption. One of them said, well, how about if you commit a crime and then pray you won't get caught? <laughs> how about you commit a crime and you pray you don't get caught? Or when you do get caught, you pray that you won't get punished or the punishment will be easy. And then someone said, well, we're all in trouble there because how many people are speeding, praying not to get a ticket or that the police won't see them? Hmm, we've got a witness here this morning. I see that. Some of us are paying attention here this morning. Then someone else in their class asked this question. How about if we, when we, we want to be ready for Jesus to come, but we're waiting for some last day great sign to get serious about our commitment to Jesus? Is that presumptuous? Yes, it is. It's really presumptuous, isn't it? And then they started to get a little on some more challenging, difficult topics. One student said, well, what about a girl, a guy, they want to be physically intimate and they're praying that she won't get pregnant? That's presumption, isn't it? Sure. Some of the common areas of presumption today. One, claiming God's blessings while knowingly disobeying him. Claiming God's blessings while knowingly disobeying him or his Ten Commandments. You see, if Satan can get us to the place, our, place ourselves unnecessarily in the way of temptation, he knows that victory is his. 
And that is why Jesus said in Mark chapter 14, watch and what, friends? Pray that you enter not into temptation. See, if we had a real prayer life that will keep us from placing ourselves on dangerous ground and compromising situations, that will save us from a lot of defeat, a lot of heartache. Every human being struggles with presumption. Every human being struggles with appetite and passion. Whether it's presumption or whether it's appetite and passion, guess what it is? It's all self-trust. That's the bottom line. All of it is. But praise God that it's His glory to forgive. It's God's glory to bind up wounds, to heal us, to pick us back up, to direct us on right paths. That's what God loves to do. And I praise God every day for His mercy. He doesn't want us to fail, but He does expect us to learn. And He does want us to be victorious by His grace. Perhaps the most common way presumption snares people today has to do with assuming that you can be a Christian without daily meditation and prayer. There are a lot of people that I talk to, they just don't have a devotional life at all. And for some reason they expect that they're going to have power when they need it. Do you think that's presumptuous? It certainly is. Ever wonder why you're not as patient as you should be? Or why you might get irritated or angry too easily? Ever wonder why lustful thoughts come quickly and easily to your mind? Or why you failed to be loving as Jesus? Ever wondered why you haven't had peace of mind? Ever wondered why you didn't, you're not bringing other people to Jesus Christ? You see, every day and any day that you and I do not spend adequate time in prayer and in the reading of God's Word, we are living the sin of presumption. If you don't have prayer and Bible study, what you're really saying is, God, I can live the Christian life without you. Now, no one's thinking they're saying that, but that's in fact what we're doing. Can we live a Christian life without Bible study and without prayer? We can do nothing without Jesus. There's no way. And that's why with David, we ought to be praying this prayer in Psalm 19. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. I want you to notice, friends, that God scales sin. And presumptuous sins are great transgressions. You know better. And you seek God's blessing, but you're disobedient. Interesting, isn't it? Jesus, in his victory over the second temptation, showed that we can overcome the sin of presumption. Someone can say amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says that God will make a way of escape and we've got to take that way of escape every single time. However, continuing to live in presumption will make us unready for death and will make us unready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Faith in, is real, trust in God. Knowing that you can obey God because he is almighty and he is the trustworthy helper. Jesus was asked to jump, tempted to jump into or in presumption, and he refused. Let me flip the script real quickly on you here. If God asked you to jump in faith, would you do it? Would you do it? During the terrible days of the London Blitz, World War II, the air raid bombings in London usually came at dusk or in the night time. A father was holding his son by his hand as they ran out of the building that had just been bombed by one of the Nazi uh, flybys. And in the yard in front of them, there was a massive hole made by one of the shells that had fallen there. And you know when the bombs are dropping, you've got to find shelter very, very fast. And he was desperate to know where to go. He saw the hole. He thought to himself, I'm going in. And so he jumped into the hole and once he was in, he turned around, arms outstretched, and he told his son, jump, I've got you. Terrified, hearing his father's voice telling him to jump, the, the boy said, I, I, I want to jump, but I cannot see you. I cannot see you. He couldn't jump where he couldn't see. And the father, looking up in the sky, tinted red with the burning buildings, he could see the silhouette of his son and he called out, you may not be able to see me, but I can see you. I can see you. Jump. 
And so he jumped, reassuring himself with the words. And as he jumped, he said, catch me. Catch me, Dad. And he did. He knew his father's voice and he trusted his father. You see, Christian faith enables us to face life and even death. Not because we, are, we can see, but because we are seen. Not because we know all the answers, but that we are known by the great God of the universe. Speaking of Orion and the constellations in our Milky Way and the numberless constellations and galaxies in this vast universe, the Bible says these profound words, For all these things, God says, my hand has made, and all these things exist, says the Lord, but on this one I will look. What does it say? On this one I will look, on him who is a poor and of a contrite spirit, who trembles or has respect at my word or trusts my word. That's faith in God's word. And as faith in his word is nurtured by reading the scriptures and by spending time in prayer, friends, we have a father in the heavens that sees us, that knows us, who is more interested in all the stars in this great universe and galaxies. And he can catch us and he can hold us and he can keep us and he can lead us. Why? Because the Bible says he does great things past finding out. His wonders are without number. And friends, when we know him, when we know him, we trust that he knows us and that he loves us and that he can do whatever he wants to do needed for our faith. Faith is trusting God loves you and trust that he knows you. And then when we have that type of faith, it is so easy to obey and we obey in joy. And when we are with Jesus and when we trust in God, we can go anywhere with Jesus and we can go there safely by his grace. That's the name of the hymn we'll be singing as we close together today. Anywhere with Jesus we can safely go. So for the first time, we will have a trio. Oh God. God. Never practice, but we will do it together. Oh, you want me to still help? Oh, yes. <laughs> we'll have thought Novia was coming to our rescue here. <laughs> Wait, sister, <good. laughs> okay. Oh, we're singing a cappella. Oh, we're singing a cappella. Okay. We're going to sing a cappella. Please stand with us as we sing together. Anywhere with Jesus. Anywhere with Jesus can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I am not alone. Other friends may fail me, he is still my own. Though his hand may lead me over dreary ways, anywhere with Jesus is a house of praise. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can say, Anywhere with Jesus I can go to sleep When God round about me creep Knowing I shall wake and more to roam Anywhere with Jesus home sweet home Anywhere, anywhere cannot know anywhere with Jesus I can
safely go. Amen. Amen. Thank you both. Appreciate it. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that because Jesus was victorious over the sin of presumption, we may be also. But we can only be victorious when we trust in him. When we spend time with him, we get to know him. We allow his word to come in and change us and, and we spend time with him in prayer. These are the only ways and the only tools we have to be victorious. We thank you that Jesus was willing to suffer and go through these trials, paving the way for us that we might follow in his footsteps and be victorious as he overcame. We might overcome also. So we're thankful for your grace. We're thankful for Jesus. We're grateful that your eye is upon us, even though we cannot see you. You can see us. And when you ask us to jump, help us, Lord, to just trust your word and be obedient. We thank you for your blessings. Keep us the rest of this day. Guide and direct our footsteps. May our hand be in the hand of Jesus. And may we be a blessing to others around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.